All right, let's hear the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God. We thank him for it. I invite you to bow with me as we pray in preparation. Our Father, because we do not live by bread alone, we need your living and active word to take hold of our lives and form in us the very character of Christ. We know that is to your glory. So we pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to respond in faith. For the glory of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. <clears throat> well, over the last... <clears throat> I'm fighting a little bit of cold, so I'll try to shut the mic off if I'm going to cough. But hope, bear with me. <clears throat> over the past several weeks, uh, as you know, if you've, you've been with us, we've been focusing on these five solas of the Reformation. These solas, that word sola is Latin for alone. Um, they, and, and we've, we've been focusing on these. This is the last of, of that series today. In Latin, they read sola scriptura, that is scripture alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Solus, Christus, Christ alone. And today, sola, soli, uh, sorry, soli deo. Gloria. And, and these alone statements really summarize the core of what it means to be evangelical. We call ourselves an evangelical church. Really, identifying as evangelical simply means that the gospel, the proclaimed message about Christ, that that, that message matters to us in as much as it, that message itself, is God's power to save people. So it's in that light that we call ourselves evangelical because these alone statements matter because really they are the core of how we understand the gospel. So I'll summarize it in English. It's simply this way. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as revealed in scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. That's stated differently on the screen, I think. As, oh no, I, I did it the same. Sometimes I put scripture first. But either way, the, the whole package works together to really get us to the core of what it means that we call ourselves evangelical. Today we're focusing, as I said, on the glory of God alone. And really what this does, this statement, it, it answers these questions. First one, what is the purpose of God's grace poured out on unworthy sinners? What is God's purpose in opening our hearts to even have faith? Why did God send the Lord Jesus to secure our salvation? And why is it that God has revealed these truths to us, and in fact himself, in his word? And the answer is, to the glory of God alone. And I really think that, that when we consider this question, to the glory of God alone, or, or how it answers that question, it, it really, in fact, should get us to think about why God does anything at all. Why does God do anything at all? I think focusing on 
God's glory alone is helpful because it is our natural human tendency to put ourselves at the center of God's purposes. And of course, it's understandable. It's understandable that we, that we think this way because the personal benefits for those who have enjoyed the grace of God, the personal benefits of, of God's mercy are infinitely wonderful, especially, especially when considered in light of the condemnation that falls on those who reject the gospel, who reject Christ. The ones who just refuse to repent and believe in that very message. We tend to think, God did this for me, and he did. But that's not the orientation that we need to have, and the scriptures actually make this very clear to us. Well, our Bible text that that I read, we read together, uh, Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, really shows us how God the, the triunity of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, how they have and continue to work together for our salvation. And so what is on display here is the great mystery that God is one. There's one God, yet three distinct persons sharing a common purpose, yet with distinct roles. And... If you've pondered this a little bit, uh, I do. I come back to it all the time. I, I, I have to conclude that our finite minds cannot fully grasp this, how God can be three persons, yet one God. But I think all of this is just yet another reason to humble ourselves before the majestic greatness of God in all of his glory. Well, anyway, my, my aim in this message is really to help us see that our greatest joy is found Our greatest joy is found in what brings God the greatest glory. Our greatest joy is found in what brings God the greatest glory. And what brings God the greatest glory, listen, is not that he should save anyone, but that he should put on display his glorious grace in saving some. It's a different perspective. Now I understand it may be hard to grasp. That God should somehow be the center of his own purposes. Maybe that strikes you as narcissistic. Okay, maybe it does. I understand that. Yet, consider this. If God were anything less than limitless perfection, if he were anything less than that, he couldn't be God. He wouldn't be. And if God did not put on display his own perfections, including his grace towards us as the most praiseworthy thing in all of the universe, if he didn't do that, if he didn't put that on display, he wouldn't be truthful. (laughs) And if God isn't truthful, then he wouldn't be God. Right? It's not possible for God not to be truthful. So the most praiseworthy thing in all of the universe is his grace for us to, to really focus on. And if he does not bring our attention to that, then God is not being truthful. And therefore, not God. It, see, we have to have it this way. The center of God's purposes is to proclaim his glory. And we get carried up in that to our eternal benefit, of course. Now we get this. If, if any person tries to bring glory to themselves like God would, right? If any human seeks glory for themselves that way, the, right, the way that God rightly does, we, we find it offensive, naturally speaking, because we know that no one around us, no person possesses the divine perfections of God. And therefore, they're going to be unworthy of such praise. And, and one who would try to draw attention to themselves, humanly speaking, would only prove that they are self-deceived. Yet it is fully appropriate for God to do what he does for the praise of him. Now, when we surrender in our minds to this truth that everything, including our salvation, everything, that is is done for God's glory alone, then we begin to see that our greatest personal benefit, our greatest personal benefit comes when God is most glorified. God saves us because he is gracious. And even though we gain an eternal benefit, he does not save us for our sake, but he saves us for his own sake. Uh, One of my favorite authors and pastor, uh, John Piper, I regard him to be a mentor from a distance because he doesn't know me. I just read his stuff. Uh, But anyway, he's mentored me (laughs) in as much as he can through his books. He says this, and I like it. God is most glorified in us 
when we are most satisfied in Him. God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in Him. Now, the word glory, glorious, shows up in the text that we read three times. Uh, Verse 6, verse 12, verse 14. And in each of these references, each of these verse points, uh, really we, we see what God is doing or is, has done related to the very salvation that he has given us. And what that does, it results in more glory. And glory being dignity, radiance, brightness, approval, honor, majesties. These three sections show how God working for our salvation brings more glory to God. So, with that introductory section, let's get to the exposition of this word from God. As usual, I've got three outline points here. You can follow along in the worship, uh, there's a, uh, an insert in the worship folder. And they really highlight three truths that identify what God has done for the praise of his own glory. So, right to the first point. Here we go. First point is this. To the praise of his glory, the Father planned. The Father planned. That's that blank there referring to verse 6. Now, we know that planning is a good thing. Of course it is. We live our lives by making plans. And, and those plans that we have have desired outcomes, of course. And you could just think about getting an education. This may be on some of your minds or your children's minds or your parents as you're hopeful it's on your children's minds. We get an education in order to learn, to be equipped for the kind of work or career that we want. We, we have this idea and we make some plans to attain that education. You had a plan to attend. You had to plan to have the money. Along the way, you planned in order to attend class. You planned to make time for research, hopefully, and assignments, hopefully, students, um, so that you would plan to graduate. And if you didn't plan to do those, some of those things, you knew somehow that your plan to graduate may be foiled, right? But after college, you planned to get a job and so you applied by planning with certain employers in the hopes that that you would get that job and you set your alarm clock with the plan to get up at a particular time so you could get to work and do that job you planned to meet someone who caught your eye you planned a dinner you planned to get to know him or her better you planned a wedding i know that's fast but anyway <laughs> you planned to find a place to live life is planning we get this and and we take it for granted we must plan you know the adage if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And understand this, God plans too. Okay, I know the deist would say that God just wound up the universe and went off and had a cup of tea and let it roll. But that's not how it works. The Bible tells us that God is a planning God. And our text really gives us that focus. God is involved in everything, right down to the smallest element, even things and parts that we have, science hasn't even discovered, God's in that deal. But of course, the difference between God's planning and our planning is that our planning can be foiled. We can plan to do something, but something might get in the way. We don't have all of the power and authority to to make those plans work out. But when God plans, when God plans anything, the outcome is absolutely certain. His plans are never foiled. And so we see here in our text that we read together, the Apostle Paul begins with this, this statement about God's planning. And it begins with, this doxology. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And really what he's saying is, this is a reason to praise God. God has done something here that gives us a reason to be delighted and to, uh, to further put a spotlight on what he has accomplished. So what here has the Father planned? Well, he planned to show his mercy and grace. He planned to show that to certain people and to bring them into a special relationship with himself. Now, God doesn't leave anything at all to chance. Because, in fact, there's no such thing as chance. It doesn't exist. God ordains what is. What God determines to do, he does. And this includes bringing you to the knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. And for all who believe in him, and for all who will believe in him, verse 4 tells us, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. So if you're a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ today, God thought of you. He selected you. He elected you. You could not decide anything about yourself before you were created. God made those decisions. Now understand this. It's not just that God looked down the corridor of time to see passively some who would choose to believe 
No, God was active in this. He chose you so that you could and would respond to him in faith. That's what the scripture tells us here. And this choosing isn't based on our worthiness. God didn't choose us because we're particularly fine specimens of the human race. He did not. No, we're told by the scriptures that we're chosen by grace. By grace. Which means it's, it's based not on our merit, but in the merit of the Lord Jesus Christ. The preeminent Son of God. The eternal Word who became flesh. We're chosen on the basis of Him. And that's what we talked about last time in the Christ Alone message. Well, verse 5 tells us what, a, what else God planned. He predestined us for adoption. He's saying the same thing, but in different ways. God is, God, God's work to elect you, His plan, His plan to include you in His family through Christ was determined beforehand. I know that assaults some of us, but, but again, we can't take a sovereign God out of the control of the universe or he is not God. Again, this adoption that we are predestined to have, as the scripture tells us here in verse 5, it's not on our own merit, but based on the perfection of Jesus, God the Son. Verse 11, we look down a little further. He predestined, he planned our inheritance. So he decided in advance that we should, along with Christ Jesus, his preeminent Son, the eternal Word of God, the Son of God, the one who never wasn't, always was, was with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit from eternity past and will be to eternity future. We will receive, we have been predestined to receive along with him a share in the infinite storehouse of the goodness of God the Father. This is what's been promised to us. This inheritance, this, this has been decided in advance. So that which is rightly bequeathed to Jesus the Son we get included in that. So what's the result of God's making these plans? Verse 3 tells us, spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And what this simply means is that the Holy Spirit has marked you such that God does not see you as you are, or me for that matter, and I'm thankful for that. So as flawed as we are, making only in a feeble effort at obedience... Yet God sees us uh, as having the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. God sees us as if we have acted in obedience toward him. He sees us through the lens of being perfectly righteous because we are included in Christ and our sin has been covered at the cross and we are no longer, it's no longer held to our account because it was held to his account. That's the result. Spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's verse 3. Verse 4 says, to be holy and blameless before him. That's another effect of God's planning. See, this talks about what God's intent is for us. But understand this. To be holy and blameless in his sight. It's not that he looked at us to see if we could be holy and blameless. No. In fact, what he did was he saved us, undeserving sinners, in order that he might show the rest of creation what his grace accomplishes. And, and this is one of the marks, the distinguishing marks, I would say, of someone who belongs to Christ. If you belong to Christ, there, there is something at work in you that makes you desire holiness. Right? It makes you long for the day when, when sin would be eradicated. And that desire doesn't come from within us. That's, that's something that God has done to us. It's changed us. And it can only be attributed to the work of God's grace in our lives. Now, marked for being holy and blameless in God's sight does not mean, by any stretch, that we're not at present still tempted, tired, and sometimes and maybe even often failing in this regard. But what happens is, that God's intention for us somehow becomes our desire, doesn't it? And over time, if you've been in Christ for a while, you know that you have this increasing hatred for your own sin. You see in yourself the things that displease God. And you say, I, I, I want that out. And you see sin in the world around you and you're grieved by it. The things that the world turns upside down. The very moral things that just get, get completely thrown away. The things that we know God is displeased with, they become normalized in our culture and it grieves us and it, and it weighs in on us. And if we're not careful, we become judgmental of people who do not know Christ and have no 
compunction to behave obediently. And yet, it weighs in on us and we, we get that. And so, this increasing hatred for sin in our own lives ends up that we confess when confronted and we long for that day when Christ will return and there will be an end to evil of any kind. Another, another result of God's planning is that he is making known to us, this is verse 9, the mystery of God's will. Making known to us the mystery of God's will. That God's salvation, because we read through the scriptures, we see, well, God had this focus on these people, these Israelites, these Jews, but then somehow God expanded that. Well, it's not that he ever really had left anybody out, but he had a way of showing it to the world. That God's salvation, that the mystery of God's will is that a salvation would extend beyond the Jews to include a people from every tribe and nation and language on the earth. And we, who are not Jewish, Gentiles, we get to be included in this thing called true Israel. No longer is there this dividing line between Jew and Gentile. And the wall of separation has been, has been removed and we are one in Christ. This is the mystery of God's will. To unite, as it says in verse 10, all things in Christ. That's peoples. But also creation. To take the curse finally away. This is the plan that's being worked out. To remove the, cre- the curse from creation and restore everything to the way it ought to be when Christ returns. Now why has God done all of this? Is it because you were worthy to be included in God's family? Is it because you knew you needed saving? No, we have, to, we have to take this, what the scripture says. We were, we were included for no reason in us at all. God was gracious to save. He acted graciously towards all who believe in advance of us even having the faith to believe. Verse, tell, verse 4 then tells us why he had planned to include all who believe. It says, it is to the praise of his glorious grace. Hopefully that will be stuck in your head after we sang, on, sang that song. To the praise of his glorious grace. To the praise of his glorious grace so that it might be seen that God is gracious. So that it might be seen to all creation why he saved us. To show that God is gracious. And to elicit praise from all creation for how he is gracious towards us. Now one might ask, well, why didn't he just save all? Why didn't he just say, let's include them all? And that's hard, right? But we have to begin with the fact that all of us are deserving of God's condemnation. We, in ourselves, deserve God's just wrath for our sin because God is an infinitely holy God. He owes us nothing, yet he shows his grace. He shows grace to us, undeserving, and and this is true, undeserving blasphemers. And he opens our eyes to an aspect of God's goodness that would not be known to anyone in creation had we not first sinned against him, right? What do we know about God that he's forgiven us? We know he's merciful. Oh, boy, don't we know that God is merciful? Don't we need his mercy? Well, the psalmist zeroed in on this fact. Psalm 106. He recounted God's patient provision for the Israelites. It says, Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but they rebelled by the sea, at the Red Sea. Yet, he saved them for his own name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. Another reference there in Ezekiel 36. You can look at that later. But God acted for the sake of his holy name. And the Israelites profaned God's name. And we likewise have profaned his name. But through God's gracious plan, he cleaned us up. For all of us who are in Christ, he showed us our futile self-worship. And he raised us up from the dead. Where we were once held fast in a hellish grave, hewn, hewn out of sin and destruction. God planned all this before he created this world in order that his glorious grace might be put on display. Well, the second point, more briefly, I think. I'll try to be. Secondly, to the praise of his glory, the son paid. The son paid. And this is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 11 and 12, you see that there. Now, there's an expression. I'm sure you've heard it. There's no free lunch. Anything of value, anything that we enjoy of value has a cost. Even if it's free to us, it has a cost to someone. Now, what's not stated specifically here, but it is implied, is that the cost of the blessings that we have received in Christ, that is, adoption, inheritance, unity, 
knowledge. All of that was secured in Jesus Christ. And we're told how that was accomplished. Verse 7 says, redeeming us through his blood. That's how it happened. Now, if you've ever been in the unfortunate place where you had to pawn something valuable, you know, like you got into a tough financial spot. So you take some keepsake or diamond ring to a pawn shop and, and they give you some money. And you know when you get that back, that thing isn't very valuable to them, but it's really valuable to you. And when you come back to, to get it, you have to redeem it. You have to redeem it. You have to pay a huge price, far more than they gave you in the first place. That item had far more value to you than it did to the pawn shop owner. That's what Christ did by his blood. He redeemed us. He bought us back. Now, when the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, God had redeemed his people from Pharaoh. This is in our, the Exodus, in our book of the Bible. He did that through a series of plagues. And the final one, pictured in the Passover celebration that we're coming up on, that, that uh, our resurrection celebration is sort of sitting around. On the, fi- uh, the night of that final plague, the Israelites were told that they must sacrifice an unblemished lamb. And then they would have to paint the blood on the top of, and the sides of the door. The angel of death would pass over every home that had the blood painted. In a a sense, they were were redeemed through the blood of a lamb. They were were not, the plague didn't fall on them. Now, the Egyptians didn't believe it and they were unconcerned and they lost their firstborn in every single household. But the Israelites, they heard God. They obeyed because they believed his word and they were spared and they came out of the land with their families intact. Our redemption likewise in Christ. It was purchased by his blood. Not the blood of a, a little lamb, but the blood of the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world as, as was announced in, uh, when Jesus came on the scene. And Jesus willingly died on the cross and his blood redeemed all who believe. That blood, as it were, painted on the doorposts of our hearts so that condemnation that we deserve would pass over. And if you're in Christ today, it's because of the blood of Christ who has purchased you. Writer of Hebrews says this, We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And that word sanctified simply means set apart. Just like the Israelites. They were set apart from the Egyptians by means of the sacrificial lamb. And we likewise have been sanctified. That is set apart by the blood of Christ. But you know, if you follow the story through the Exodus, you know, even with the Israelites, they continued to disobey. They all stood at the mountain of when God gave the law through Moses at Horeb. And they pledged faithful obedience to God. Everything that you said, we will do, they said. And yet, again and again and again along the way, they returned to the rebellious ways. Clearly, clearly what they needed was something more than to be physically separated from the enemies of God. They needed to be bought out of slavery, not to a nation, but of sin itself. That's what they needed. And that's what we needed. Here's how Peter explains it in his first epistle. You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver silver or gold. That's not what ransomed you. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That's what the blood of Jesus accomplished And that results in verse 7, says the Son giving us forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of God's grace. We're told that later in Ephesians, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so why did God do this? Why did Jesus die and take upon himself the condemnation that we deserved? The condemnation of all who would believe Were we worth saving? No. Not at all. It's so that what might be put on display to the rest of creation is how God is so gracious to save. And this was done all to the praise of his glory. Well, thirdly, and even more briefly, I trust. To the praise of his glory, the Holy Spirit guarantees. That's that third point. You can see that in verse 14. Now, we use that word guarantee in common terms. The word guarantee refers to the commitment somebody who's selling something would make to the purchaser of that product or service. They make a guarantee to the customer that if the product or service fails, if it fails to satisfy in some way, that is replaced 
done over or the money is refunded. That's how the word guarantee is used in our parlance. But in verse 14 it says, the Holy Spirit seals the one who has believed as a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. And the word, the way that word guarantee is used here, it's a little bit different. It's like we'd, we'd use the word deposit or down payment. An earnest, providing a certainty for what is promised. So when you go to buy a house, you're putting down a deposit when you sign the deal, right? You put down earnest money, a deposit, a down payment. It's because you're going to follow through. If you, don't, if you don't follow through, you lose the deposit. Well, that's the sense that, except that the Spirit can't, uh, wouldn't not follow through. He gives, uh, the Spirit is given as a guarantee, a deposit. The Apostle Paul uses this language elsewhere too. 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22 he says this, and it is God who establishes us with you in Christ. Talking about the unity of the believers. And has anointed us. And who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee, a down payment. So what this means is that the Holy Spirit, who creates new life in the one who has heard the word of truth and believed that very word, also, amazingly, gives something of himself to indwell the believer. God's spirit takes up residence in the one who has believed in Christ. That's the dis- deposit. It's a kind of a mark. That mark is for God's delight. And it's also for our benefit. So as in we increasingly reflect the character of Christ, we do enjoy the benefits of living more righteously. That's the work of the Spirit in us, right? Living day by day in increasing agreement with God's purposes. Additionally, the Holy Spirit gives us that reminder that what we have here Because it's a struggle. We all know this. What we have here is not our ultimate reward. There is an eternal inheritance in Christ that we long to possess. And that certainly benefits us. 2 Corinthians 5 says this. For while we were still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. So what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He's talking about resurrection, our bodies being restored. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has, and here it is, given us the Spirit as a guarantee to remind us of what's to come. So why does the Spirit mark us? Why does does the Holy Spirit do this? To to keep us focused on that inheritance, to to build in us the very uh, holiness that God wants to produce in us. Why? Why? It is for the praise of his glory. And it's primarily for God's delight. Because the presence of the Spirit indwelling the believer brings actual change in our lives. So over time, we increasingly reflect more and more of the character of Christ. And of course, that brings God glory. It happens slowly. Sometimes really slowly. But surely, over time, The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, pride or bitterness or divisiveness or greed or lust. And and then our affections are changed so that over time we increasingly want our lives to be about what is pure and generous and for God's glory. So God shows his power to save and set apart a people and that is to the praise of his glorious grace. So what does this mean for us? Well, I just want you to, in application, just some thoughts. If God does everything for his own glory, then I think it ought to have a significant impact on how we think and what we, do, what we do, right? So think about this personally. Family relationships. Your marriage. If it's for God's glory, everything, including our salvation, including our existence and our family relationships, including our marriage, how do you behave to your husband and your wife? Are you seeking to build them up in the faith? Are you seeking to encourage them? Are you sacrificing for them? How are you as a parent? Are you seeking to to do what glorifies God by by teaching your children about the Lord Jesus? How about your work? What does that do to your work? When you go off to work, if you're doing it for the glory of God, your work's going to be marked by integrity. You're going to be somebody who shows up on time and does the job you're paid to do. And you're going to go, in fact, above and beyond because you're not working for that employer. You're giving glory to God. You're doing something to say, God, you're more important than even my employer. And they're going to benefit greatly 
because you are first? How about how you relate to those who do not believe? Don't you think it's going to move you to pray for them? To long for them to know Christ and His salvation? Even your leisure, the things you do in your spare time, when you waste time, <laughs> right? Are you using it for God's glory? Well, how about as a church? Think about what we do corporately. And obviously, what comes to mind is what we do in worship. And, you know, Bobby's done a, a great job of being very intentional. The songs we sing. Why are, why are those chosen? Is it because they make us feel good? Well, they might. That might be an effect. But primarily, it's about the words that are in those songs. Why is it that we pray like we do? Why is it that we read scripture like we do? We try to do everything and plan everything that we do in the context of worship so that we put the spotlight on the glory of God and show how wonderful He is. And we remind ourselves how needy we are and how, how broken we are and we rest in the wonderful grace of God and that puts on display the greatness of God. And so we're not inclined to think about what entertains the world. What we do here. I mean, listen, I've been guilty of that. Think, wow, what, what will really appeal to somebody who's never been in church? Shouldn't we do that? Maybe it'll be outreach oriented. I, I don't know. Well, there's something to be said for hospitality and, and being kind and welcoming to people who aren't part of the church. But you know what? Our first priority, our audience is God. We do what we do for His glory. How about our ministries? The things that, classes that we teach or why we do what we do. Are we seeking to put God's grace on display? Because that's what we're told here in Ephesians, that God does everything for the praise of his glorious grace. We want people to see the grace of God. So, whatever ministry we're doing, we're thinking, what well, glorifies God. To make disciples is something in the scriptures and that glorifies God. How we reach out. God is glorified. You know, I, I've said this before. We, we share the gospel with people sometimes total strangers, in the hopes that they'll believe it. But you know what? Even if they don't, it's still worth saying. It's the most God-glorifying thing we can say in all of creation about what Christ has done for us. And we pray that they'll believe. We hope that they'll, they'll trust Christ. But you know what? It's still worth saying because it is the pr for the praise of His glorious grace. Well, let me end with a scripture here. Since, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we, with all that, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God.